Good evening and welcome. My name is Alice Knapp. I'm president of the Ferguson Library. And as I welcome you here, this is your opportunity to silence your phones. Um, we are really delighted. We've been working with the Dylan Schneider Group in Hearst for seven years on our civility lecture series. And it has been a really great seven years where we've had some unique speakers talk about a variety of different topics. It's been unusual for us to invite somebody back but we did because his topic is so special and relevant to us. So with that, I would like to introduce Jan Dylan Schneider of the Dylan Schneider Group. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Stephen Cohen, who is the President, Chief Executive Officer of C Research Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization which operates Mystic Aquarium and Jason Learning. They're committed to protecting um, the ocean environment. Sea Research Foundation accomplishes this through public engagement in conservation, STEM, education, and research programs related to the ocean and environment. Mystic Aquarium is the largest cultural attraction in, the south, in southeast New England with an annual attendance of three quarters of a million people. Lots of them little. <laughs> Oops. Water is very important to our environment also. We don't want to waste it. Um, Dr. Cohen has been an officer of Sea Research Foundation since 2001. He was appointed chief operating officer in 2004, completed radical restructuring of the organization and the financial platform, and reduced the $20 million debt became president and CEO. Um, Dr. Cohen, um, prior to the Research Foundation, he was chief executive officer of Jason Foundation for Education, now known as Jason Learning. He has served as executive director of two educational organizations and held faculty appointments at Tufts University, Bentley, and Cambridge. Dr. Cohen, has earned a bachelor's degree from Brandeis, uh, a master's from Brandeis, um, and a doctorate from Brandeis. <laughs> um, he's a wonderful human being. We've known him for quite a few years. He's the first, one of the first patrons of my artwork. But I'll tell you one thing. When you call um, Mystic Aquarium or Sea Research, um, you know, the little thing that comes on the telephone says, um, if you know the, the um, extension, please put it in now. Nobody ever does know the extension. Second, it says, if you're calling about um, an animal in danger, uh, please press two. Now, I thought that was particularly interesting of how important that was, how important the animals are, how, how important the fish are. And... Um, I find it fascinating also, you know, everybody's talking about going to the moon again or going to Mars. I have heard that we know much more about the surface of the moon than we do about the ocean floor. So I think we have a great deal to learn. And I don't know of anybody better than Dr. Stephen Cohen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, you referenced all those, all my time at Brandeis, which is a lot. And uh, I'll just tell you this. Uh, today, uh, I learned that our gala event was scheduled for Saturday evening of Rosh Hashanah weekend. And so all my Brandeis experience came to uh, fruition today in explaining why we can't do that. So there you have it. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, in addition to Jan, I'd really like to thank Alice Knapp uh, and the Ferguson Library for your hospitality tonight and for all that you do uh, in your mission work here in Stamford. Uh, libraries are wonderful places. All of you know that because you're here, and I thank you for being here. But libraries are wonderful places, and um, some 
years ago, I had a, a, a long drawn out conversation. It was somewhere uh, up near Buffalo. I was up there in business for some reason. The guy who was driving me uh, to a meeting was telling me that there'd be no more libraries, um, that people were gonna do everything online. And I argued uh, fiercely and I said, that's not true because the primary uh, thing that people do in libraries is to get together with other people or to be with other people even if they're alone and to access resources that, um, that are not readily available. So libraries have reinvented themselves and this is one of the best in the state and Alice, thank you for your leadership of that, of this library. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Mystic Aquarium uh, is a treasure uh, in the state of Connecticut and I'm very honored to be uh, serving as its president. And tonight I wanna talk about uh, the future of whales and why we do what we do at Mystic Aquarium with, with uh, beluga whales in particular. But whales are called the sentinels of the sea. And the reason for that is that they tell us what's happening in the ocean. Uh, they're the top of the food chain. So their survival uh, really depends on the overall health of the ocean the entire biosphere. And right now in our world, several species of whales are disappearing from Earth at a very alarming rate. It's estimated that only 300 to 1,000 northern right whales remain. Southern right, humpback, bowhead, blue whales, all of these species number less than 10,000 animals. We have an ethical obligation to reverse this devastating trend of extinction. Why? The disappearance of whales is telling us a great deal about our own future as a mammalian population species. The human species is thoroughly dependent on oceans for our survival. Jan mentioned most of our oceans are unexplored. We know less about our oceans than we do about the surface of Mars. That's astounding. And yet, we are completely dependent upon the oceans for our own survival. The ocean cools the earth so that we can live. It's the primary source of food for many nations and many peoples. It is the source of medicine and the wave and tidal patterns of our oceans uh, shape our, the terrestrial, it, it form the terrestrial shape of places like Connecticut, and in fact, the entire world. If we think of ethics as the application of values, then we must ask, do we value the earth we live on? And if we do, then we need to protect the whales. Now, for many years, this message of saving the whales was perceived as a leftist slogan. Uh, it, it's been trivialized in our popular cu culture, save the whales as sort of a generic label of various uh, people's political leanings. Today, uh, however, saving the whales must be our clarion call. We cannot wait because as whales go, we as a human population may also go. To save whales, we have to take steps to rapidly advance research that help them survive both whales and other cetaceans, dolphins, other cetacean populations. The vaquita, by the way, a cetacean that looks much like a porpoise, a small porpoise, is down to, I believe, less than 100 animals and may even be less than that. So the vaquita is basically about to disappear from Earth. Well, only science-based public policies are going to positively change this trajectory of extinction. And one of the greatest concerns with the vaquita and with other uh, populations of cetaceans is low birth rates. Beluga whales and other species are having trouble reproducing. So it's easy to say it's climate change, it's easy to say it's one thing or the other. The reality is we don't know, but what we do know is that cetaceans are having trouble reproducing. And what is known is that constantly changing environmental conditions, whatever the reason may be, and you can surmise what the reason might be, 
Uh, but limited, some, some of the particular reasons are limited food supply, noise, human activity. Uh, all of these things increase the stress level for belugas and other cetaceans. And that stress has an adverse impact on pregnancy and birthing. So one of the things at Mystic Aquarium that we do is to study beluga whales as a representative species of cetaceans. They're a, a very good uh, representative of, of cetaceans, generally because of their physiological structure, because of the uh, various environments in which uh, they live in the wild. Our scientists, led by Dr. Tracy Romano, have advanced knowledge of the immune system of whales, stress factors that cause a lack of breeding, and other issues related to why whale species are struggling. So key to our research is having a group of whales under controlled conditions that can be studied easily and efficiently. Recently, uh, Mystic Aquarium applied to the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Marine Fisheries Service, for permission to import five uh, captive-born beluga whales from a place called Marineland Canada. Uh, they would come to our facility, which is the largest outdoor beluga habitat in North America and it is specifically designed for research. There is also, of course, a display component, but uh, the entire facility is designed for, uh, for non-invasive research. Moves of whales like this one inevitably attract attention, and that is legitimate. Whenever humans impinge on any species, questions should be raised about whether it is necessary, whether it is in the creature's best interest rather than just exploitive, and whether it's being done well. We think the answer is yes to all of those questions. And the first point to recognize is that belugas, like other whale species, are highly endangered or threatened in many parts of the world. Two beluga populations in particular are threatened, one in the St. Lawrence estuary and the other in a large expanse of water uh, in Alaska known as Cook Inlet. The threats they face are almost entirely human-induced, from noise pollution to the stresses caused by shipping traffic and coastal construction projects. The Arctic, as you know, is, a, is the new frontier, the new global frontier, with nations fighting uh, for position in the Arctic uh, to control the, uh, the oceans and to uh, lay, in some cases, their flag uh, on the floor of the ocean to lay claim to it. Um, shipping lanes have increased substantially. Ports are being built. Uh, it is a, the wild west of the globe right now. And the issue is that it is having uh, an, an adverse impact on belugas, but also on many, many other species. So it's imperative to learn how these various factors uh, are affecting the reproductive systems in particular of belugas. And, and by doing so, to help us to figure out strategies and public policies that will lead to uh, solutions for the survival of these species. Moreover, the information that is gathered uh, will help advance international protection policies for marine mammals everywhere. And uh, this is you know, just really important that we advance knowledge that will lead to public policies to protect cetaceans, marine mammals everywhere. So Mystic Aquarium is a, is a very uh, great place, a good place for this research to happen. It is uh, the leading marine mammal research institution in North America, if not the world. Uh, we have a team of scientists, one of the largest staff of scientists in the world dedicated to marine mammal research, and um, animal behaviorists, veterinarians, and in addition to the research that's being done, we provide uh, a very, very high level of continuous care uh, for the belugas that we study. Again, all the research is non-invasive uh, research, but it, it does require uh, training animals to do certain procedures uh, to uh, give, for example, blood samples or, or uh, blow samples, what are called blow samples, uh, so that uh, saliva samples, so that the stress levels can be tested um, and, and then compared to 
samples in the wild. But one of the challenges in the wild is uh, very di it's very difficult to uh, track wild belugas or, or many uh, cetaceans in the wild, number one. Uh, number two, getting to them is very difficult. And number three, the tools, believe it or not, don't exist to uh, conduct research in the wild. So one of the things that we have been doing at Mystic Aquarium and that we are um, hoping to rapidly advance in the next uh, five years is the development of new technologies and tools to uh, conduct research in the wild. And that would include uh, things like telemetry, which is essentially uh, take, being able to take um, accurate photographs and assessments of wild animals to determine wild belugas and other cetaceans to be able to determine sex of the animals, the size of, uh, of the pods. Uh, we don't know a lot about the size of the pods in the St. Lawrence, for example, which is a relatively controlled environment but of course the Arctic is not, so we know even less about the, the pods in the Arctic region. So um, this is what we call conservation research and uh, it, it, it needs to be done in a, in a controlled setting. It's important to point out that the transfer of these five uh, animals that I'm talking about is, um, they're, they're all uh, coming from overcrowded conditions at a place called Marine Land in Niagara. Falls, uh, Canada. Um, the that's been a very difficult situation up there. So, in one sense, this is a, a rescue operation for those five whales. Uh, there's about 54 whales currently in residence at Marine Land, and we're working with that institution. Um, they have new management leadership, so we're working with them to advance their animal husbandry and to uh, hopefully make the conditions there more uh, more humane and better for the individual uh, animals. There's growing um, interest in the idea of sea sanctuaries as places where you could do research or where captive born animals could go to. And this is basically uh, the idea of taking a swath of ocean, um, dedicating it to a uh, particular species. Uh, most of the advocates for this are saying it should be same sex. Uh, so that there isn't a breeding of captive uh, animals. And so one of our areas of research is to look at the efficacy of these sanctuaries, the idea. It's an unproven idea and it m may actually be uh, fairly dangerous for the animals because their immune systems are not uh, developed uh, to live in, in a wild uh, or a relatively wild situation. Uh, there's also issues like noise and ship traffic uh, many other things that come to bear. Right now, there's only one functioning um, sanctuary, and that is up in Iceland. There are two animals, two beluga whales up there. There's only one functioning cetacean sanctuary. This one happens to be two belugas up in Iceland. Um, and the, the issue there is, uh, first of all, it's been funded by Merlin Entertainment, uh, which was just bought out by uh, by a venture capital firm, so the question is, is there a long-term commitment? It costs millions of dollars to maintain, uh, well, to maintain Mystic Aquarium's Arctic coast costs about $4 million a year. So um, to do the same in a, in a relatively wild setting is that or more. The question is where is that uh, going to come from in terms of sustaining the operation? Our, our uh, uh, revenue comes from people coming to, uh, to our facility. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's the question of uh, the health of the animals. So these are untested. Um, it's an untested concept, and we have committed uh, ourselves as an institution to uh, help uh, learn more about whether um, these are feasible or not. Um, to what end are we conducting research? I've asked this question of our staff, and when they didn't know me when I first came there, they were quite insulted by that question. To what end are you doing what you're doing? Uh, well, we're doing it to collect data and advance knowledge. Well, that's great, but how are you, how are you gonna do that? What impact are you gonna have? And I think what we have, um, where we are with this today, our scientists, Dr. Tracy Romano and others, is that uh, it's absolutely urgent 
that we do more than simply collect data and uh, hypothesize. We have to uh, contribute rapidly to the development of conservation policies and technologies and approaches that uh, intervene to save uh, species. Think about this. We know a lot about dinosaurs. A lot. A whole lot about dinosaurs and what happened to them. But none of them are around anymore. And uh, hopefully uh, what we're doing will uh, change the trajectory for uh, cetaceans and, and beluga whales and other, uh, other cetacean species. So over the next five years, we're committing uh, significant resources, millions of dollars to uh, the research of beluga whales. And we have a close collaboration with the University of Connecticut. Our uh, research laboratories, the uh, uh, physical laboratories, are located on the uh, Yukon Avery Point campus. And all of our uh, scientists have faculty appointments at Yukon. So this allows us to uh, reach economies of scale in uh, terms of use, of use of laboratory space, allows us to collaborate on an interdisciplinary basis uh, with uh, all sorts of disciplines, actually, economists, uh, historians. Uh, one of the things that we're, uh, that are very key to uh, beluga conservation is the impact of um, the loss of species on Native Americans who uh, depend upon uh, belugas and a few other species uh, for their subsistence. If you think about someone way up in the middle of, uh, or way up at the top of Alaska, let alone the middle of Alaska, uh, there are no supermarkets. There are no 7-Elevens. Um, they live on what they hunt, and their tradition is uh, to live on uh, the meat of beluga whales and, uh, and other uh, animals, wild animals. And it's a very sacred uh, tradition as well as, uh, as well as providing nourishment. And so there are a lot of issues, complex issues around this. Uh, you know, you might say, well, they shouldn't do that and maybe they should go move somewhere else. Uh, that certainly has been said. Um, but you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, people who have been there for thousands and thousands of years. And, and these are not only, uh, as I said, um, traditions that, that relate to nourishment and survival, but also that relate to their spiritual uh, existence. So these are complicated issues. And by working with, uh, at UConn, with a, an interdisciplinary team of, of uh, faculty, we can uh, approach these issues in a much more comprehensive way than we would uh, alone. Uh, one of the things that, that this addition of whales will do for Mystic Aquarium is to validate some of the findings that we already have. Uh, hopefully validate some of the findings that we already have. We need a larger cohort. Uh, we have uh, three beluga whales in residence at Mystic Aquarium. It's just not large, a large enough uh, sample size. And so by increasing that sample size and by uh, developing re uh, research collaboration with the facility up in Canada and working with them to improve conditions, we're going to have very quickly uh, have a much larger sample size that we can uh, draw some uh, definitive conclusions from. I mentioned that um, one of the aspects is the design and ground truthing of uh, what we call ground truthing, which is to to test le the legitimacy of some of the technologies that can be used uh, in research. There's something called Critter Cam uh, that's used. Critter Cam is a camera system that can be attached to, uh, to whales and other animals um, to get uh, video images of their diving and their, and their interactions with pods, and then it, it falls off uh, in, the, in the water. Uh, so it's non-invasive to the animal. Uh, but there are a lot of technical issues around this, and that's just one example of a tool that really needs, uh, needs to be tested. Um, so uh, photogrammetry I mentioned uh, as another uh, technology that needs to be developed. And um, so this, these technologies and other aspects of our research are all uh, geared towards shaping conservation uh, policy. Well, what those policies might be, uh, well, it could well be uh, the change of shipping lanes. Um, there has been a lot of work in the 
uh, Marine Sanctuary off the coast of uh, Santa Barbara, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, uh, to change shipping lanes. Um, this takes a lot of dialogue with uh, stakeholders. It also takes a lot of uh, data, a lot of science and analysis to uh, help private parties and public entities uh, work together to, to change uh, policies. So, and other considerations would be uh, fishing stocks, uh, you know, what, what fish are, are a part of the, uh, the allowable catch, and uh, perhaps encouraged movement or migration of animals to more productive or less stressful uh, ecosystems. The holy grail of our research is to find, uh, to help belugas and other animals with the reproductive process, as I said earlier, um, and to understand uh, what natural behaviors lead to reproduction, what stress factors inhibit reproduction, behaviors and conditions that allow for successful gestation and birthing. Uh, that's what we really uh, need to better understand. Funding for marine mammal research um, is largely an afterthought in, uh, in our nation now. You know, many people will probably stand here before and after me saying we need more funding for research. Uh, but right now, there's virtually no funding for marine mammal research. And, um, and yet, um, understanding these issues of extinction are really key to helping uh, resolve uh, some vexing human health issues and also um, the future of our own species. So uh, investment in new sources of energy uh, generated from ocean wind, which is a major uh, push in, in the northeastern United States is one potential source of funding for uh, marine mammal research. There are a lot of questions about what the impact of wind farm developments will be on uh, marine mammals. Uh, and that includes, you know, the construction and the, the noise that comes from construction, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, changes in migration patterns and uh, fish uh, species uh, or the, or the um, prevalence of fish species around these uh, systems and so forth. So there are a lot of issues around the, the ecosystem, the changes to the ecosystem that could uh, evolve as a result of uh, construction and installation of these uh, systems. So that's one source potentially for funding marine research. Um, another is uh, working with federal agencies such as the Department of Energy, which is um, responsible for looking at the impact of uh, wind and other, other ocean technologies on marine mammal populations, um, the Bureau of Energy Management, the United States Navy, Office of Naval Research. They do provide some level of marine mammal funding as does the National Science Foundation, but very, very uh, small amounts. One uh, initiative that is uh, coming up in the next year is the reauthorization of something called the National Ocean Partnership Program. And this is an interagency effort to support uh, innovative ocean research. It's uh, essentially to set the, uh, in large part, a research agenda for the United States. And it's a uh, consortium of all of the agencies that I just mentioned and a few others. Um, but one of the things that we'll be doing is to uh, call for that uh, effort, the reauthorization of that effort, to focus uh, at least some attention on marine mammal research. And, you know, here's the reality. As little as uh, five to ten million dollars would make a huge impact on uh, marine mammal research. It would support uh, us, it would support we're not looking for the five to 10 million, but it would support you know, places like Moat Marine Laboratory and other scripts and other institutions that are uh, involved in this. It would really rapidly advance the ability to, uh, to take the data we have and provide better analysis and, um, and do more uh, application of research in the wild as the uh, tools become available. So <clears throat> I just wanna, uh, close with two thoughts. One, there are examples of success in the conservation of whale species. The Western South Atlantic humpback whale has had a remarkable recovery. Uh, from a low of 440 whales in the early 1960s to 25,000 animals today. And that's the result of conservation.
policies uh, that were enacted, including the end of, of whaling, biggest contributors to their demise, but also uh, other, other policies around fishing uh, and protection of, uh, of environmental, uh, protection of uh, ecosystems. Um, and there's been other successes. The American alligator is one of the greatest success stories uh, in our country about, with regard to protecting an endangered species and stellar sea lions, which we have at Mystic Aquarium, uh, are also a success story. They're, they're very much on the rebound. So the second thought is, as we think about the future of whales in relation to civil society, which is the topic of tonight, uh, we might consider the words of Gandhi. Quote, the, greatest, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way it treats its animals, unquote. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I know you mentioned using non-invasive non -invasive techniques, but it seems like everybody now has a pet with a microchip. Could something like that be effective in studying the whales because uh, it would not fall off and it seems like a simpler technology? Uh, also, is there a global effort, not just interagency, but is there a global, global effort as well? And I think another success story has also been the shark population in Cape Cod following their food. Yes, yeah. But um, there are other things I'm thinking, but that's enough for now. So microchips are, um, are an answer to tracking animals, and we do, uh, we, Mystic Aquarium, but also other places do microchip animals to, to, to uh, track um, where they're going. Uh, it has limited uh, viability for two reasons. One, it really only provides tracking information. So you get a lot of data on migration patterns. And the second thing is they fall off, after they fall out at a certain point. Um, so the, their reliability after a certain point has, has been uh, negligible. But they do provide with seals, uh, seal, the rebound of sharks has a lot to do with the rebound of the seal population. and. Uh, seal migrations have been tracked uh, quite a bit in, in over the last decade to understand you know where they're going, where, where they're eating, uh, uh, and so forth. Of course, they eat, and then the sharks come along and eat them. So there you have it. Yes. How can one uh, try to make our representatives and people in the biz you know in the country figure out how we can fund more of this? I mean, obviously, it's most most important. Well, it's a, it's a superb question, um, and you know, I think that there is growing awareness in our country about the oceans and the importance of oceans, and certainly plastics. Um, jump out as, as an issue that um, I think people are more and more aware of the danger of plastics uh, to animals and to the environment generally. Um, so in, in a large degree, the plastics issue is a uh, marquee issue. It has more to do with generating awareness of the ocean environment than it does of the actual issue. I, I, if you look at it sort of in a broad policy perspective, um, it's remarkable how, how aware people have become about plastic bags, plastic bottles, and so forth. Um, how you can help is by, um, you know, the classic answer is by contacting your legislator or, uh, or member of Congress. That certainly helps. Our particular delegation here in Connecticut is very, very um, aware of and proactive with regard to ocean issues. So we're very fortunate in that regard. Um, but I think that, um, so that, that's all important, but I think that individual actions go a very long way. And one of the things that we're finding at Mystic Aquarium is the, that uh, people are yearning for ways to engage with the environment in positive ways. So last year we had 50,000 people involved in conservation action programs, and that ranged from uh, citizen science projects where people uh, went out and counted uh, horseshoe crabs 
uh, which are a threatened uh, species, uh, and frogs, which are very threatened. And understanding what the population is is critically important to understanding what, you know, what the problem is and what to do about it, where, where you find them, what condition they're in, all those are, are key questions. So I think finding projects, and the other things that people were involved with, coastal marsh restoration uh, and so forth, but that's a lot of people. And it's really struck me uh, that that's new over the last couple of years in terms of the, the programs that we're offering in that area. And so to go from sort of zero to 50,000 people is, tells me quite a bit about what people are yearning for. And, and that, that is going to make a very big impact, I think, if 50,000 people here in Connecticut and 50,000 people in Rhode Island and you know, California can do better than 50,000, but you know, thousands by thousands, one person by one person uh, engaging in that way, it is making a very big difference. And it's making a difference with how kids, young people think about the environment. That being said, young people are a lot more attuned to the environmental challenges uh, that we face uh, than, than older generations. And I think that's a very hopeful uh, sign. Uh, does the uh, uh, Mystic facility collaborate with other organizations uh, such as Coastal Studies up on Cape Cod, which is very concerned about whales? <clears throat> and uh, secondly, the St. Lawrence is such an important shipping corridor, and yet it's been disastrous for a variety of whales. Is there any practical solution there? Um, so we collaborate a lot, uh, is the answer, and uh, that's pretty much how we, how we do anything that we do. Uh, in the St. Lawrence, we're, we're collaborating with a group called uh, GREM, um, I think it's a terrible acronym, <laughs> Grim. but it's and I and I off the top of my head I forget what it's what it stands for. But they do they're the primary research entity on the St. Lawrence, so we're dependent upon them to uh, you know to, to to really show us the way and um, and we 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 both fund them and also uh, our scientists work side by side with them. Uh, and then the the group on uh, on Cape Cod we work with them. We work with Woods Hole. Uh, we work with Scripps, we work with URI. Uh, so uh, it's really important to, uh, to push those collaborations because um, scientists very often find themselves in a, in a um, for all sorts of reasons, in a silo. And, and it's probably driven by, f by funding to a large extent. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, we're constantly trying to, to make sure that we're not in a silo and that we're connecting uh, on an interdisciplinary basis and, on an, and, and, and with other institutions. Um, the second question was the St. Lawrence Seaway and shipping. Um, so the shipping industry uh, is, um, on the one hand, uh, talking a lot amongst themselves about uh, the environment environmental impact, um, but they're very slow to uh, make change. Uh, the Channel Islands, where, which I mentioned in changing shipping lanes and even in, in uh, Stellwagen Bank uh, and the, you know, around uh, close to Boston Harbor, incoming traffic to Boston Harbor, where there were also changes made in the shipping lanes, um, this has taken years to accomplish. And the cost of, um, the, the cost is huge to the shipping industry, and those, um, that push is coming at a time when the industry is declining. So um, there, there's a tension there between a declining and aging industry and a push for uh, greener practices all around, including double, double hull ships, uh, quieter ships, um, and more uh, environmentally friendly, more efficient ships. So um, that's the challenge. And the other challenge, which is the biggest challenge, is that most uh, ships are not registered in the United States. They're registered in foreign countries, the Marshall Islands and other places, which have you know, no regulations on, on, on uh, environment, or few, if any, 
uh, regulations on 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 uh, environmental, uh, or I should say, on, have very few environmental regulations on ships. So, um, I think this is a, an issue that groups like the Connecticut Port Authority. Uh, which you may have read about recently, but the Connecticut Port Authority right here in Connecticut. I think that going back to your question, um, you know, there's a lot of noise about what the Connecticut Port Authority is doing or not doing, but this is an issue that they ought to be tackling right here in Connecticut. What are we, are we placing requirements on ships coming into our waters to New Haven, the Port of New Haven and the Port of New London? And I think that's the way this is probably going to go down in the United States. The United States is a leader on environmental issues. Uh, and I think sometimes we bash ourselves. We are the number one consumer and uh, a very large contributor to carbon emissions uh, and of course a huge consumer of, uh, the largest consumer of uh, product in the world. So every issue comes back to the United States. But at the same time, you know, our policies and practices are far ahead of most uh, countries developed or undeveloped, and certainly way, way ahead of China. And a lot of the um, the challenges that we see with marine mammal populations uh, go back to to China and go back to uh, India and other undeveloped uh, or developing countries. China's not a China is a first world country, but I think you understand my point. Um, do you think there's any hope for the renewal of the Marine Protection Act and any hope for any marine conservation funding, considering you know, our current administration's stance is not very conservation friendly, typically? Well, I, I do. I think that um, these are, well, uh, these are issues that have been over a 30 to 40 year period bipartisan. Uh, some of the, the most important legislation on oceans came during the Nixon administration uh, and uh, during George H.W. Bush's administration. Uh, President Bush, George W. Bush, uh, was the first to create a marine national monument. Uh, President Obama created uh, one, the first on the East Coast in the Atlantic Ocean. So the, these issues uh, have traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support. Um, I think that if you were to ask me about today and tomorrow, uh, it, it's just there's too much noise to, to make any progress, uh, noise in Congress, noise in the administration. But I do think that um, we see, I see a lot of support from people like Senator Sullivan uh, from Alaska, and who's a Republican, uh, and then our, our team here, Senators Murphy and Blumenthal. I mean, they, as different as they are and as much as they uh, disagree on just about every issue, this is one issue that, that they can seem to reach consensus, some level of consensus on. Now, it's not a great level of consensus right now, but there are, there are things that they are working on and agreeing on. So I see that as hope. It astounds me that we know less about the floor of the ocean than the space. In the, the equipment and the technology that's been developed to explore space, can it be also translated to advancing exploration undersea? Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the focus of ocean exploration now is on autonomous underwater vehicles. And, uh, you know, in the last... Uh, well, 25 years ago, it was on remotely operated vehicles, but autonomous underwater vehicles, which are essentially missiles that are deployed uh, and can do all sorts of uh, data collection, mapping, uh, et cetera. Um, those are a very effective strategy, you know, right out of space, to your question, uh, that, that can uh, advance, significantly advance ocean exploration and research. You still need ships. Uh, you still need investment in in uh, higher education and post-higher post education to get the scientists in the pipeline to uh, do this kind of work. Uh, you still need submersibles 
there was there's a kind of an ongoing uh, debate in the uh, scientific world about remotely operated vehicles versus submersibles. Submersibles cost, you know, uh, close to a billion dollars to build, and a remotely operated vehicle can cost uh, a million dollars to build. Um, but submersibles put humans uh, down under, uh, and that's I think very very important. Uh, for us to see with our own eyes and experience with, with our own senses what's going on down there. But you can get at much larger swaths of the ocean with AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, and remotely operated vehicles. I'll take the privilege of the last question. Um, once in the Tebnikoff Bay off of Alaska, and then once in the fjord near the St. Lawrence, whales have gone under my kayak. Can you talk, yeah, yeah, it's an amazing experience. But can you talk a little bit about their personality? Each, uh, I, I, I can't uh, talk in great detail about them, but each whale has its own personality, and those personalities are uh, very sophisticated. Uh, at Mystic Aquarium, we have um, uh, Juno, who is probably our most famous uh, beluga whale, and. Um, what, what's fascinating is his, Juno is uh, fairly young, he's about uh, 15 years old, um, but his ability to sense human emotion is profound uh, and to, um, to react to uh, sensory stimulation. So music, for example, is something that, that, uh, that he reacts very, very positively to. Um, the curiosity is remarkable. Um, if, if we've seen situations where, uh, you know, if a, if a child is, uh, you know, crying or something like that, he, he will come up to them. Um, so these are, you know, very sophisticated animals. They're very um, high, higher order beings. And um, other, you know, our other two whales don't, don't do that. They, uh, one of them will, you know, go pretty far away when, when there's noise or when there's any kind of uh, activity. Um, so each of them have their own personalities and they are, you know, as I said, very intelligent, incredibly intelligent animals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.